Imagine if you bought a new streaming device and all of a sudden, without having to connect the device to the internet, live TV, live weather, and other information automatically displays on your TV. It doesn't matter where you are in your house. You could be in an upstairs bedroom, you could be on your main level, or you could be in a basement, and it always works. And this doesn't have to just work with streaming players. This can work with literally any device that's used to handling internet protocol data and has a built-in antenna. And yes, all of this is possible with ATSE 3.0. In order for over-the-air TV to be adopted by as many people as possible, this would have to become reality. People should be able to use over-the-air TV without even realizing that they are using over-the-air TV. Over-the-air TV should be the backbone that connects all devices regardless if you have an internet connection and regardless of where you are geographically. All of this would be possible even with built-in antennas on these devices with robust modulation and code rates. This video is part two of a three-part series exploring ATSC 3.0's full potential. <laughs> First, let's compare the reach of NTSC versus ATSC 1.0 versus ATSC 3.0. So with NTSC, you get analog degradation. This is what broadcast NTSC video looks like with the luminance carrier at certain SNRs. The video portion of an NTSC broadcast signal is modulated using amplitude modulation, which is more susceptible to interference than frequency modulation. While broadcast NTSC video turns to bright snow well above the noise floor, analog FM audio can last all the way to the noise floor before being consumed with static. This is one of the reasons why the audio could still sound decent when broadcast NTSC video was unwatchable, although this effect was largely reduced since the FM carrier was powered much lower than the luminance carrier. Here's a representation of analog FM radio hitting the noise floor. Approaches the state. Much of Maine is under a tropical storm warning and Lee is expected to bring high seas. While analog systems visually and audibly degrade, digital systems do not. They hold their integrity for the entire time until they reach that minimum SNR requirement. So in the case of ATSC 1.0, all the way until 15.2 decibels, it is a one-to-one -one copy of what it looks like coming from the broadcast transmitter. Once it hits that point, it spends about a half a decibel pixelating and drops below that point, the signal's gone you're gonna see no signal displayed on your TV. And this is where things change with ATSC 3.0. And if you're looking over to the right of the screen, you're gonna see there's a lot of different combinations with ATSC 3.0. In fact, there is well over a million different combinations, almost 2 million combinations, just with the capacity calculator app that I have on iOS and on my Mac and doing even more combinations that aren't even depicted on that application, there is easily at least 10 million different combinations that you could create out of ATSE 3.0. It is mind-blowing how many combinations there are. So there can be an SNR as high as 36.54 decibels and an SNR as low as negative 5.5 decibels. This means that an ATSE 3.0 signal with at least one of its PLPs implemented with a minimum SNR below the noise floor would allow for reception way below where NTSC would turn to static and snow and way below the point at which ATSC 1.0 would display no signal. Most ATSC 3.0 stations at the moment are not being implemented anywhere near that low of an SNR. Most are trying to mimic ATSC 1.0's minimum SNR, maybe a little bit below that, maybe a little bit above that, which is why some people say, oh, ATSC 3.0 has improved my reception. But there was an ATSC 3.0 broadcast for a period of time that was being sent out at a two decibel minimum SNR. So two decibels above the noise 
noise floor, this signal could still be received. And that station was VBA257, the test ATSC 3.0 transmission from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Now, Mark Colombo, commonly referred to as TRIP, has a great website called rabbitears.info. This website has longly rice propagation maps of TV stations, and when you look at the maps, you'll notice that they all end in that 41 to 50 DBU medium outdoor category. This red zone basically shows that given average background noise conditions, the signal will come in from a few decibels above a 15 decibel SNR to right around a 15 decibel receive SNR. These maps aren't perfect, but they do a good job explaining how strong a station signal is on a map. When VBA257 was being added to the site, I asked Tripp if he could put on an extended coverage map depicting the coverage of what at the time was a 2 decibel minimum receive SNR, and he was able to create the map. And this is what it looks like as a propagation map. So as you can see, that red is where an ATSC 1.0 signal would end, but this pink is the signal ranging from basically anything below 15 decibels all the way to two decibels. You can see how much more coverage this gives to the signal. So anything in this pink is just new coverage that has just been given just by implementing the ATSE 3.0 signal at that low of an SNR. And you can see all of this new coverage area and there is a lot of area. And keep in mind, this is a very low powered signal. This is only 52 feet off the ground and it's got only 781 watts for an effective radiated power. Having a signal so robust like this can go two ways. It can go in the way like I was describing before where all of a sudden more people in a wider geographical area just get the signal now when before they wouldn't. This also means that individuals within a wider range of a broadcast transmitter could receive over-the-air broadcasts on mobile devices. Also, because these signals would be so robust, there wouldn't be a need for services like Lowcast for people who don't want to install an antenna. So all of this is possible with robust modulation and code rates, but what even are modulation and code rates? ATSC 3.0 uses OFDM, but each PLP gets assigned its own modulation and code rate. So these are the modulation choices. There's QPSK, QAM16, QAM64, QAM256, QAM1024, and QAM4096. Now, as you go down this list, the complexity of the modulation choice increases. Basically, the more you go down this list, the more the modulation is changing the radio wave in a way that makes it more complicated. As far as code rates are concerned, ATSE 3.0 uses 215 to 1315. So here's what this means. Shown is two examples, a signal with a higher minimum SNR and a signal with a lower minimum SNR. The signal with a higher minimum SNR has a code rate of 1315. What this means is that for every 13 useful bits in the transmission, there are two redundant bits, which are used for error correction. On the left is how many useful bits there are, and on the right is how many bits there are total. And in order to find the redundant bits, you take the total amount of bits, you subtract the useful bits, so 15 minus 13 equals two redundant bits. So in this transmission, it is not very robust because there's only two redundant bits. This means that the signal has a higher minimum SNR. Now on the right side is a transmission with the lowest code rate possible with ATSE 3.0, a code rate of 215. So for every two useful bits, there are 13 redundant bits. And of course, we find this by taking the total and subtracting the useful bits from it in order to find the redundant bits. So in this case, there's 15 total bits and there's two useful bits. So you get 13 redundant bits. So as you can see, most of that RF channel is being taken up by redundant bits, which means that less data can be put in that RF channel. There's just less bits that are available to convey useful information if you have a very robust transmission. Now, on the other hand, if you don't care about robustness, you can have a lot of useful bits, but it's going to cost you with that SNR being very high. 
What if you're using a less robust modulation and code rate, or any modulation and code rate for that matter, and you want to boost the RF levels so that the RF levels in the area are consistently strong? In order to achieve that, you would use a single frequency network. Now with single frequency networks, you have a bunch of stations that are all operating on the same RF channel and are each timed perfectly in order to match up with one another, to not cause destructive interference, and to actually boost the signal. And by doing this, you're boosting the RF levels in the area, which allows for wider reception of less robust signals. Single frequency networks are great for areas with very large population bases because it'll be worth the infrastructure to install all of these transmitters everywhere and there'll be more of a likelihood that people are actually using it because it's in a more densely populated environment. The problem that I have with single frequency networks is that I'm afraid broadcasters will only put clusters of transmitters in areas that are densely populated, leaving people in the countryside out of over the air TV because the modulation and code rate is so high that it doesn't reach out there. Now there's nothing preventing a broadcaster from implementing a single frequency network with a very robust modulation and code rate, and I hope some broadcasters do. By the way, VBA257 is actually a single frequency network and it uses three transmitters, even when it had a two decibel minimum SNR. And as of the time of recording, it is still operating as a single frequency network with a 16 decibel minimum SNR. So with all the fundamentals out of the way, let's explore some cool use cases for ATSE 3.0 and other technologies like 5G broadcast. Streaming services like Pluto could have their linear live TV feeds broadcast using ATSD 3.0 instead of through the internet. So here's how this would work. On the left represents Pluto TV as it is, which is sending data using the internet, and on the right would be using ATSD 3.0 to send its data. The barrier to entry to use Pluto currently is that you need an internet connection. Also keep in mind because there's constantly data that's being sent back from your device to Pluto's servers, there's limited data privacy. In fact, when I first went into the app on Apple TV, it asked me whether or not this app could track my activity. Now using ATSC 3.0 in a mode where it wouldn't be connected to the internet, you would have a very similar experience to Pluto with the internet connected Pluto. But in this case, you would have the option to not have an internet connection and still be able to use it, which would mean that there's no community communication back to a server, which would make the entire experience very data privacy conscious. Now, the only barrier to entry for this scenario would be the fact that there would have to be adequate signal coverage in order for the ATSC 3.0 signal to reach your devices. So since I have the Apple TV developer mode, I decided to check out the codec being used and the bitrate of the video streams coming from Pluto, along with what audio codec they were using and what bitrate they were being sent at. They're all using AV at 1280 by 720, so 720p, and they're all sending out these channels at approximately 2.4 megabits per second with a variable bit rate. And for the audio, they're using stereo AAC at 96 kilobits per second at a variable bit rate. So this is what they're currently using with the internet to provide their current service. But hypothetically, using ATSC 3.0, we could lower the bit rates even more by using more advanced coding. So in this case, I have have this set up for 1280 by 720p VVC at 0.6 megabits per second, which is the exact same quality as the 2.4 megabits per second AVC. And then for audio, I chose XHE AAC stereo at 80 kilobits per second. So if you were to tally all this up and say, okay, 0.7 megabits per second per virtual channel. And by the way, that also includes sending the channel artwork or the channel logo and all the text data that's associated with that. If you were to take that 0.7 megabits per second and multiply that by the 250 channels, you would get 175 megabits per second total. So how do you take 175 megabits per second worth of data and send that over an ATSC 3.0 signal? Below are two possible scenarios. 
A single frequency network with two 6 megahertz RF channels using MIMO QAM4096 with an 1115 code rate would have approximately a 29.5 decibel minimum SNR and would allow for 182 megabits per second of throughput. And another option without using MIMO would be a single frequency network with four 6 megahertz RF channels using QAM1024 with a 1315 code rate. This would give you a minimum receive SNR of 29 decibels and a maximum throughput of 179.5 megabits per second. Now, Pluto using ATSC 3.0 could still have personalized ads even without an internet connection. Examples of this include telling the app your gender, whether there is a family watching, what products you use, and more. GPS or ATSE 3.0 based location finding could also be used to determine your location and target ads to you that way. In this scenario, the app would store all of this information on device, so your device itself is the one targeting the ads to you, not a server. So the linear feeds that are being sent out could supply all of the advertisements that any demographic would need. Think about these tags as having information like whether they're geared towards women or men whether they're geared towards older people or younger people. And these ads could also have tags with geolocation. So only show this ad in a certain area and it could use your GPS and say, well, this ad is out of range. So we're going to omit this one, but this ad is saying is in range. So we're going to display this one. And the tags could also have expiration dates for the ads. So if the advertiser only wants the ad to be shown for a certain amount of time, it'll just auto delete whatever ads have expired. Now, a lot of the linear channels that are on Pluto are also on Sling Freestream, Freebie, Tubi, the Roku channel, Zumo Play, Plex, and Samsung TV Plus, among others. To make things even more efficient, all of these services could take advantage of the one broadcast transmitter serving a market. That way, each streaming service would be able to pick and choose what channels they have a deal to show on their service. Now, linear TV doesn't have to be the only service service broadcast. On-demand movies and TV shows can also be sent out using ATSC 3.0 or 5G broadcast. This is called data casting. For some reason, when people think of data casting, they think of outdated services like Movie Beam from the mid-2000s. That was a flop for Disney. There's nothing like waiting a full month just to receive three new movies you don't want to watch. And you'd have to pay for them. More on Movie Beam in a future video. ATSC 3.0 and 5G broadcast could approach things in an entirely different way. Movies would broadcast based on dynamic streaming demand. If 1 million people are streaming the top 5 most popular movies on Pluto, an ATSC 3.0 or 5G broadcast signal could rapidly broadcast those 5 movies over the air. This has a substantial impact. This provides the movies to the 1 million people in the most efficient way, puts way less strain on the internet and server infrastructure, eliminates any possible buffering, and subsequently broadcasts those free movies to individuals without an internet connection. The future of over-the-air TV shouldn't be screwing in a coaxial cable into the back of your TV. The TV itself should be the antenna and the content should be delivered over the air without the internet and accessed in apps, as if it were accessed using the internet. Since ATSC 3.0 and 5G broadcast are IP-based, broadcasters have the capability to send literally whatever they want. If a device has a built-in ATSC 3.0 chip and or 5G broadcast capabilities, any data the broadcaster decides to send could be routed to an app, just like how data is routed from the internet into apps that connect to the internet. The fact that the ATSC is trying to standardize new codecs like VVC shows how conventional their mindset still is with ATSC 3.0. For example, if a broadcaster wanted to use a video codec like AV1 or VVC instead of the standardized HEVC, and an audio codec like XHEAAC or Opus instead of the standardized Dolby AC4, they could. The broadcaster could have their own app on all major app stores with its own built-in codec decoding capabilities. This way, the app would be able to handle the best and newest codecs without having to worry about whether or not a device 
supports a certain codec. The app would know what IP addresses to fetch the data from, and the app would work just like it was connected to the internet. Other applications include broadcasting app notifications, weather data to weather apps, live sports scores, live stock prices, live gas prices, and so much more. All of these use cases have a trend. They all consist of data redundantly being sent out to a large population using the internet. All of this and more could be sent in a much more efficient way using an invisible over-the-air broadcast. ATSC 3.0 and 5G broadcasts have the potential for all of this. But unfortunately, as of now, none of this is happening. Broadcasters seem more concerned about implementing optional features like DRM on standard standard free-to-air channels, then actually working with device manufacturers to get an over-the-air IP future off the ground. To put this in perspective, it's like the broadcasters have a cutting-edge gaming PC and they are only using it to go on Facebook and shop on Amazon. I can't even believe that in 2023 we're still given interlaced video using HEVC on ATSC 3.0. There is so much potential both to provide numerous public goods and for broadcasters to extensively monetize their licenses, yet barely any progress has been made. The amount of Americans watching cable TV have plummeted to new lows and keep plummeting, and the amount of people watching conventional TV is at new lows and keeps falling. Cable retransmission fees are not going to last forever, and an aging linear TV population base isn't going to last forever either. Using over-the-air broadcast standards for the dispersion of internet protocol data is not only the best way for broadcasters to stay relevant, but is a way for broadcasters to solidify themselves into the technology of the future. If you like this video, consider subscribing and liking the video. Follow Western New York Over the Air on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at WNY Over the Air. Like Western New York Over the Air on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash WNY Over the Air. Support the channel on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash WNY Over the Air. And check out WNYOverTheAir.com for live band scans, cord cutting tips, and much more.